welcome back. We are talking to Daniel Tatman about the Palladian Genesis, as it were. We are, or have been talking about early biblical characters. Uh, we have specifically been looking at Seth, uh, the third son of Adam and Eve, that have gone uh, very much unnoticed. Uh, there's also, or I should say, there's not much talk about this guy, so it's a very interesting character. We might return to this again here a little bit later in this segment. Uh, but we're going to begin to uh, look at the Grecian period again and go over a few of the, um, the Grecian-Egyptian, I guess, similarities and talk a little bit more about some of the connections. And this is something that uh, that also, I guess, goes very much unnoticed uh, by. Tell us a little bit about this, uh, Dan, and, and lead us into to this topic about the, the Grecian and the Egyptian uh, period of history. Mm. Well, as I said, you know, the, the major scholarly opinion of architecture is that it runs through Greece um, and pretty much the buck stops there. They're happy with that. Um, and I guess in a lot of ways you've got the, the Greek tourist board and lots of other people that would be involved with this. And so they don't really go into where the Greeks absorbed this knowledge from that became their culture, that became their philosophy, that was used in their architecture. They kind of want a lot of emphasis placed on Greece, I think, a lot of the time. And a lot of the documentaries that come out are just trying to get people interested in the topic, so they don't really go into the origins of, of that again, you know. It must be that they have this idea that they're they're in they're the cradle of civilization, and the, and I think that they want to keep it on that level, actually. Yeah, and almost every country that has a tourist board and has sort of legends or has these places of importance, they do the same thing, don't they? Yeah. They really focus on their own country and kind of also if if the thing that they're admiring in their own culture is something which you know, superseded something else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They, they don't usually talk about what came before. Because is... they're happy about that thing that came afterwards because it's still here and they kind of think that that's good, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think it's, uh, wasn't it... You have it happening over and over again, you know? Wasn't it Solon who mentioned a little bit about that, the connection that he, he he talked with the with the Grecians that you know your your civilization is much much older and you you have borrowed from the Egyptian. Yeah, yeah. It also said that that the Greek civilization was supposedly kind of the defender of all of the free lands of Europe at that point, and that they actually were part of a rebellion mm-hmm. that threw off an older master, and that they were very well respected because of that, and it was because of this that. They had so much carnage in Greece. This is what was told to them. Hmm. Um, so they were basically telling them that they used to be of major importance, you know. And uh, I think it pretty much the saying goes that now you're like children compared to what you once were, you know. Hmm. It's a fascinating quote. Yes. Um, so, as I said, the, the scholarly opinion, they kind of leave it at Greece. Um, but then if you look into kind of the top scholars or the more specialized guys, as I said, they, they talk about routes to the city of Vey and the Etruscans. Um, and we can take that back then into the Pelasgian. Um, but also, it doesn't just stay in the, in the Mediterranean area at all, in any way whatsoever. And huge emphasis is placed on this by the overall specialists in the field. Um, but we do know that one of the, the largest temple structures that was found in Assyria um, which is known as the, the Temple of Sargon, mm-hmm. which is in Kursabad, which is now Iraq. Um, huge temple which had bas reliefs of gods and angels and all of these uh, happenings in daily life of the Assyrian Empire. Um, and these uh, stayed intact um, after the archaeologists uh, went in and rediscovered the area. They took all, all of the stuff out, mostly, and a lot of it is in the British Museum. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and the images that we have often of the winged bull with the head of a man. Yeah. Um, this this comes from these bas reliefs at Corsabat. Yeah. Um, but what they don't show in a, a lot of the exhibits, or the majority of the time, um, are a lot of the. They've also got bas reliefs that show the insides of temples from that period. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, we're talking between. 3,000 and around 600 BC, mm. you know, a long time ago. Yeah. And uh, they show quite clearly in some of these bas reliefs um, ionic columns. There we go. What we would associate with the Greek style or the Palladian style in later times. Um, 
the direct Ionix column with the, the two bunched up scrolls, or as, or as some architectural specialists say, the two ram-like horns mm-hmm. of the Ionix column. Um, and that's obviously another way of looking at them. Um, but we also, not only do we see the Ionix, but there's another part of the temple then which has Corinthian columns, clearly. Okay. Exactly the same, Corinthian. Mm. So we don't actually see all three of them. Um, we do see plain columns with uh, just a, a bog-standard kind of capital, so just a rim at the top where it's connecting to the roof, mm. um, and a stander at the bottom to connect it, to ground it, you know, to give it more strength. Yeah. Um, which we could say would be perhaps the ancient Assyrian version of the uh, the Doric column. Ah, okay. The Roman. So, so we do have all three, but the, the Doric one is not so clear. The Ionic and the Corinthian columns are clear as day. Um, and they're not shown, hardly ever. And you won't be able to find images of this on the net. Um, you will be able to find in certain pictures, uh, one of the most famous pictures that we have from that region and that time period is a picture of Shamash. Yes. Um, sitting on his throne with the sun disk in front of him. Mm-hmm. And lots of people have looked at this, and it's so interesting that so many people have looked at it and haven't seen it quite clearly, that the structure which is actually holding the, the arched piece of metal or stone, which is hanging with the sun disk on it, mm-hmm. is an ionic pillar. Yes. I've... The two spirals, you know, so people can see this for themselves. And they just type in Sumerian gods or Sumerian art or Babylonian or, or Assyrian art, and they look at enough carvings, bas reliefs, uh, and different cuneiform stones. They will see these these columns. Absolutely. But obviously, there are yeah. a large group of people within uh, uh, the kind of the service of the museums, the universities, and various groups who must be aware of this. Yeah. But this is not talked about. You know? You think it's consciously hidden that that uh, you know it sh- it shouldn't be revealed in in different exhibits or artworks, frescoes or you know uh, w- whatever it might be, and that this have consciously been taken off, taken away, taken out. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it seems to be the case, but I don't know exactly why that would be. You know, possibly they think they don't want to confuse people or something. <laughs> you know, there could be so many different reasons for it. Right. Obviously, there is a a pernicious element within. The higher institutions of, of our society. Yes. <laughs> um, who is very interested in hiding things. Um, but often it comes down to the ignorance of the people involved as well. And That's right. We have different levels to it. So again, even though we can see these uh, columns uh, in periods much before what we call the ancient Greek period or the, the Greek Dark Ages, so you know, from around 1500 BC up to around 400 or 500 BC, mm-hmm. And obviously this this period of their culture overlaps perfectly with what we would call the Assyrian culture. Mm. And they're showing the same forms of architecture. And, you know, as you, you said in the, the first part that I've been focusing on architecture, and I'd, I'd say in a sense you're right, but when you're looking at architecture or when you're looking at anything in the ancient world, their understanding was that nothing is unconnected, you know? Exactly, yeah. It's just yeah, one form of art expression. I come at it from. It's, I see that architecture is it's ideas in stone, and so it's telling you everything about the culture, even though you're, you're looking specifically at architecture. Yes. Um, it's telling you everything else about the people. You know, so I don't see it as so disconnected. I totally agree with you. I think it, it, it's it's we in in this day who are, who are compartmentalizing stuff, and that's probably even why stuff like this can go by pretty much unnoticed because they might look at this as a background of like art history or whatever and they don't look at it in the context of architecture for instance although obviously these these fields do bridge a little bit here and there but again it's it can be very much plain out in the open but it goes totally unnoticed for for most people you know yeah yeah it really does and it's such a huge period of history you know that we're talking about as well you know these are thousands of years millennia it's probably one of the most important periods in history because it seems to be that this is where most of the stuff again is kick started and it seems to go from from zero to hundred percent, you know, pretty much overnight in a weird way, you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean we mentioned it before with what we call the legacy civilization. Yes. 
Um, you know, and there's, there is a lot hanging on that term. You know, the very word civilization um, is very, you know, it's it's a personal term, isn't it? It it relates what you feel is civilized. Yes. And yet we attribute civilization, this term, to all of these early updwellings of humanity. When we actually look at these places where, where we do have these upsurgences, um, they're more empires than they are civilizations. Yes. Always headed by a king. Hmm. And mm. so this, this continuation, you know, it's... comes up to the, the present day, you know, with what we would now say our civilization mm. um, and the primitive civilization of the indigenous elders, you know. Yeah, yeah, right. I, uh... this, this plugs into the same understanding completely of what you feel is civilized and what you feel is primitive, you know. Yeah, and what rules we think is is the correct ones, or how people even should live their lives. Again, we can bring this into the context of the the most current invasion of of Iraq. This was also about bringing, you know, civilization to one degree to to that nation by the those who were or the allied, you know, forces, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and look what happened, so, you know. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so with this whole concept of these kings and these empires all using this form of architecture from, you know, from actual bas reliefs that we can see from 2,500, 3,000 BC. Mm-hmm. You know, and these are documented in images that you will find around the way, and they're also in museums, a lot of the artifacts. Um, but you can also see it if you look at the, uh, <clears throat> which is a picture that I'll send to you, um, as the famous winged bull god mm-hmm. um, with the, the man's head. Um, he's a king, and he's wearing a crown. Um, but the way that the shape of the head and the crown on top of it actually sits, you can see that it's emulating, again, a column. Mm, um, it's very, very similar to the Corinthian column. So even though they don't show and exhibit the columns themselves, mm-hmm, mm. the same concepts that run through the columns are also in the platforms and the pediments which the statues stand on. Uh-huh, yeah, Little yeah. details around them, and also the way that the actual stone was worked and the way that the concepts that were going into it you know to make it strong yeah you would be emulating kind of a brick leaning up against a pillar hmm. that would be the raw form of that that piece of art you know <laughs> that's really interesting so you can see it even in that in, in the, one of the most famous pictures of the, you know the images from assyria yeah do you think it's uh, because I've, I've been thinking about that aspect of the crown as well it's it's must go back to the, the old story of, of just, you know, making the the head larger or taller, you know, making like I'm I'm an authority, I have a, you know, I'm smarter, I'm, I have a bigger head, you know, it's like it's all about the appearance. But I'm, I'm looking at the picture right now, I don't know if that this is the exact one you're sending me, but I'm looking at that, the human head, the winged bull, basically, and you're, you're, you're absolutely right. It does look like the end of a, of a, the top of a pillar, absolutely. Yep. And, and specifically like the Corinthian pillar. Mm. It's idealized because it, he's wearing the, the helmet of the gods, you know, which some of the earliest Sumerians were wearing. But it's also got this crowned area on top. Yep. And it's not when it's carved as just as a god on a, on a stele, um, it's not carved in this way. But when it's done in a, a statuary, they emulate the strongest form, which would be pillars and columns. and. Mm-hmm. Pillars, you know? mm. Interesting, very interesting. Um, so it's it's really interesting also that other people have noted this through history. One of these uh, archaeological uh, scholars who's who's noted this is a a guy called Carsten Niebuhr. And he was a fascinating guy, he was born in Germany, um, and went to Egypt and Sinai um, and all of the Sumerian and uh, Persian. Em- 